America, and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Iran. Our guest is Masih Ali Nejad, an Iranian-American journalist and activist who is one of the most prominent and vocal opposition figures challenging the theocratic dictatorship in Tehran. Ms. Ali Nejad began her career as a parliamentary journalist in Tehran. She was forced to flee in 2009 following her coverage of the crackdown on protests against disputed presidential elections. In 2014, she launched the Facebook page My Stealthy Freedom, which sparked a movement protesting Iran's compulsory hijab law for women and girls. Ms. Ali Najad authored a 2018 memoir entitled The Wind in My Hair, My Fight for Freedom in Modern Iran, and has won multiple international awards for her activism. Iranian authorities have attempted twice to assassinate Ali Najad on American soil since protests erupted across Iran following the death of Masa Amini in custody, who was arrested for not covering her hair. Iran is home to one of the world's oldest continuous civilizations. Iran grew from a collection of semi-nomadic tribes to the largest empire on earth at the time under Cyrus the Great. In the 6th century BCE, Ancient Persians made great advances in science, math, agriculture, and law. In 650 CE, Arab Islamic conquests initiated the Islamization of Iran. In the 16th century, the Safavid dynasty instituted Shiism as Iran's state religion and sought to unify Persian society against the Sunni Ottoman Empire. The Qajar dynasty rose to power in 1789 and decentralized the Iranian state but their power waned and collapsed in 1925 when the Iranian assembly deposed the last Qajar Shah and replaced him with Reza Shah Pahlavi. Iran was a strategic arena of competition in the great game between Britain and Russia for power and influence across Central Asia, but Iran also competed in that game. In the 1930s, Reza Shah cultivated relationships with fascists in Germany, Italy, and Turkey as he consolidated his power. He saw early Axis victories in World War II as an opportunity to expel the British, who profited inequitably from Iran's oil wealth. After the 1941 Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran, Reza Shah abdicated to his son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. In 1953, Mohammad Reza Shah staged a coup against the elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh that strengthened the monarchy and tightened foreign control over oil reserves. In 1963, the Shah launched an aggressive modernization campaign that accelerated economic growth, redistributed wealth, and isolated traditionalists and clerics. Opponents of the Shah gained popularity for expressing anti-American and anti-Western sentiment, especially the exiled Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. The Shah faced growing social unrest and fled Iran in January 1979. Less than one month later, Khomeini returned as the Grand Ayatollah and became supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The revolutionary stormed the U.S. Embassy and held more than 50 Americans hostage for 444 days. Across his 10-year rule, Khomeini and his fellow revolutionaries continued to use anti-American and anti-Israel propaganda to consolidate their grip on power. In 1980, Iraqi forces invaded Iran under orders from Saddam Hussein. Khomeini described the eight-year Iran-Iraq war as more than the defense of Iran's territorial integrity. It was a war to uphold Shia Islam and spread the Islamic Revolution. After Khomeini's death in 1989, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei became supreme leader. In the following decades, Iran supported proxies and terrorist organizations against the United States Israel, 
Europe, and its Arab neighbors, including a proxy army in Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, Iraqi militias, and the Houthi militia in Yemen. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps supplied terrorist cells in Europe with weapons and provided safe havens for al-Qaeda after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In August 2002, an Iranian exile group revealed the existence of a secret facility capable of enriching uranium for use in nuclear warheads, in violation of the 1970 United Nations Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. In 2015, Iran entered the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which the Barack Obama administration intended to curb Iran's nuclear program. The United States left the agreement in 2018 due to concerns that the deal was fundamentally flawed and undermined U.S. interests while increasing funds available for Iran's proxy wars. Public hijab has been compulsory for women in Iran since April 1983. The so-called morality police enforce it as they choose. Since Masa Amini's murder at the hands of the morality police in September 2022, Iran has seen the largest protests since 2009, despite the death of over 200 protesters at the hands of Iranian security forces. The response to Amini's killing has sparked calls for the overthrow of the regime and an end to the Islamic Republic. Iranians are protesting the corruption and inhumanity of the theocratic dictatorship after a rigged election of a president who was complicit in the execution of 5,000 political prisoners in the 1980s. The Iranian government has killed, beaten, and arrested protesters while restricting the ability to use social media platforms. But the protests have continued undaunted, and videos have gone viral. We welcome Masi Ali Najad to discuss the protests in Iran, their implications, and her vision for the future of her country. Masi Ali Najad, welcome to Battlegrounds. Let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to, to, to see you and, and uh, how grateful we are that you're here to help us understand the dynamics within Iran at a critical time. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting me. I'm very excited. Well, see, I wonder if you might begin with a little bit of your personal story and, and just what it was like to transition from a tiny village in Iran uh, in the post-revolutionary period, you know, going to school and and learning chants of death to America. And now you're now you're uh, you know, now you're with all the hipsters in Brooklyn, you know, so, so. I, know, I know. I mean, my life is a journey from a tiny village north of Iran in a very, very tiny village, very traditional family. Um, and I remember that I used to. Uh, grew up in a, in a community school telling us that we have to say death to America as loud as the White House could hear us, or even say death to um, Israel as loud as the Tel Aviv can hear us. But listen, I'm coming from that generation and from that kind of uh, being washed, but and now I'm in America giving voice to the teenagers, school girls, saying death to Islamic Republic. You don't hear any single slogan among Iranian young generation saying death to America or death to Israel. Clearly, I am part of that community. And I, I, I uh, always say to, to people in America that, you know, maybe you see when you turn on the TV, Iranian TV, you see people saying death to America, but bear in your mind. I was one of them. We wanted to have good relation with America, with Israel, with any, with, we don't want to be isolated, but this is the mentality of the Islamic Republic. Yes, from my tiny village to Brooklyn, I'm now a proud Iranian American journalist and activist. Well, see, there certainly is, does seem to be a generational dimension to this, uh, to the protests that we're seeing in, in Iran today. So much activity in the universities, for, for example. Uh, but you, you've been you've been seeing the, the shift among the Iranian people for quite some time. I mean, you covered and saw what was happening in Iran during the 2009 Green Movement. Could you describe for our viewers, you know, what you know your observations of how opposition to the regime, the theocratic dictatorship in Iran, has evolved in in your lifetime, and and what you what your assessment is of, of the protests today? Maybe compare. Uh, the protests of of today to to pre to previous ones and you know 2000 you know, 2018 or or 2009 yeah exactly look many analysts journalists in the west saying that 
Iran has seen many uprising, many protests across the country, 2009, 2019, and, and some of them trying to say that that became part of their culture. So, but I have to say that this time is totally different. First of all, this is the first time in our history that you see in a large number, women shoulder to shoulder with men burning their headscarves. We've never seen that. This is the first time. This is not about economic, which can be about economy, can be about the uh, lack of, uh, like, you know, um, water, electricity, everything that took people in the street, the increase of, of the price of gasoline. But this time, it's about dignity. It's about women. It's about basic rights. It's about like teenagers, like like women taking to the street, like school boys saying that we want to have a normal life. We want to have our basic rights. Clearly it, this uprising, um, it's about religious dictatorship, you know, started uh, from uh, like the brutal death of Mahsa Amini, but now women, men shoulder to shoulder in the street saying that enough is enough. We don't want to be told what to wear, how to think, what kind of lifestyle to choose. We want normal life. We want a secular democratic country. I remember that for years and years when I was campaigning against compulsory job, many people in the West saying the same thing that, you know, we don't wanna to touch this issue because compulsory job is like part of your culture. That was an insult to a nation when you're calling a barbaric law part of your culture. And now you see the true culture of Iranian women burning headscarves and saying that we want an end to gender apartheid regime. That's the difference. Well, I mean, that's a really important point you bring up is how Americans view Iran and Iranians. And of course, it is an incredibly rich culture, rich, rich history. Uh, that's been suppressed in large measure since the revolution with this revolutionary ideology. Can you maybe share with our viewers what your perspective is on various American views of what's going on in Iran and the Iranian people, the nature of the regime? Because as you know, there are some people who say, oh, it's really our fault. We should accommodate the regime. We're the ones who caused this. And and I think it's <laughs> profound. It's profoundly arrogant to say that because you don't really acknowledge the agency that oh the, my god the, the oh my god the yeah. leadership has right <laughs> exactly i mean even about my, hmm. myself i see that some of the academics here some of the journalists some of the Islamic lobbyists i'm trying to say that oh Massey is an american agent i mean oh my god i mean why because i live in america america is a land and of freedom of expression. So I came here to actually express myself. I mean, but, but let me tell you something. If I was an American agent, then I should have supported the nuclear deal, no? Because, you know, Obama was pro-deal. Trump was pro-deal. And now Biden was desperate to get the nuclear deal. But when I came here, I was like, you know, I want to use this opportunity to echo the voice of Iranians who want to have the same freedom, and I don't want the US government to bury human rights under nuclear deal. This is a clear message. So, but those who are actually saying that um, like this uprising is happening because of America or putting the blame on American sanction, I think that clearly they are ignoring the agency of Iranian people. I'm a woman from the Middle East. I grew up during the revolution. I, I, I experienced, like millions of other women, we experienced discrimination. We experienced poverty. We experienced war, revolution, everything. And through our pain, we became powerful to uh, shout and chant that what we want. Nobody can say that, you know, uh, you don't deserve uh, freedom because you're from the Middle East. When um, but George Floyd brutally got killed here. Everyone, we're like in the airport, people were in the streets. When um, the women's march happened, people were loudly shouting, my body, my choice. So this is acceptable for women, for people in the West to be united, to talk about human rights. But when it comes to women of Iran, women of Afghanistan, suddenly you say, oh, we have to stay away because this is their culture or we shouldn't interfere or we shouldn't talk. Or, that's not acceptable. This is 21st century. 
And we want an international women's march actually. Right now, I want to see that in New York, women are taking to the streets and saying that we want to support our sisters in Iran. Today, I actually saw that Hillary Clinton uh, powerfully supported Iranian women, which is beautiful. But at the same time, it just reminds me of the time that Hillary Clinton, President Obama, they were hesitating to support uh, 2009 Green Movement. Now it's time that I think um, the US government, the Republican, Democrats, they should see human rights abuse in Iran as bipartisan issue and recognize Iran's new revolution. You know, Marcia, I think a lot of times Americans don't really understand the nature of the regime. And I think when you hear these arguments about, hey, well, it's our fault because of sanctions, they don't recognize that this is a kleptocratic, right, theocratic dictatorship that is in control of the economy through these bunyads. And they've exactly. they, they, they've destroyed the economy, not not the sanctions. Okay. I'm happy that you know the you know about bunyad and the, the corruption among uh, mullahs. Uh, let me just give you some. Um, let me just give you a better picture about the situation in Iran that, that how irrelevant is this when people put the blame on sanction. I'm not saying that sanction doesn't hurt, but we are suffering from sanction which has been imposed on us by Iranian regime. From the age of seven, our basic rights have been taken away from me. It means that as a girl, if I don't cover my hair, as you see, I have big hair, even it's not easy to cover them. <laughs> but if I don't cover my hair, I won't be able to go to school. I won't exist in my own homeland. And who imposed sanction on us? Forget about our basic rights. Those who actually took American diplomats hostage. Masume Eftekar was the spokesperson. Her son lives in uh, his luxury life in America. Javad Zarif the relative of the Ayatollahs, the relative of the you know, spokesperson, the relative of Khamenei, everyone, Khatami, they live in America. And in Iran, they say death to America. There is no investigation about uh, the, the relative of these Ayatollahs, whether they are involved in money laundering or not. And they are the, the same people saying that because of the sanction, Iranian people are suffering. Let me give you an example. When we were suffering because of sanction, Iranian regime proudly saying that we send the money to Syria, to, to Lebanon, to Yemen. They made a huge hospital in Venezuela. They, are, they send money to Hamas and Hezbollah and Bashar Assad, proudly saying that although people of Iran were suffering from sanction, the budget of 51 religious institutions increased. And these are like Bunyad, morality police, uh, Mesfas institution, Khamenei's institutions, Khomeini's institutions, which these are being run by their children of Khomeini and Khamenei. So you see, the money goes to the religious institutions like morality police to kill people like Mahsa Amini. Right. So right. you and, see- and it, and, and it goes to sustain their over four decade long proxy war, right? Against the, the, great, the great Satan. <laughs> You know, the Israel, what do they call the cancerous boil? And then the Arab neighbors, right? There's the just, Arab neighbors. And, and, and they call us, they call us warmonger. When we say that we're not agree with nuclear talk now, you have to stop negotiating negotiation with these murderers. They blamed us and they call us warmonger. And those are the same people who actually praised Qasem Soleimani, one of the most dangerous warmonger who got killed by the U.S. government. My brothers, two of my brothers, they got, they, both of them, they got injured during the war between Iran and Iraq. And then you think that I support the war? One of the most dangerous warmonger regime is the Islamic Republic, which you see that they send the money to their proxies in the region. And that is why I actually call on Republican, Democrat, to see this as bipartisan issue. And if you really care about democracy, you have to be united to, against the Islamic Republic. Because look, I mean, honestly, the Islamic Republic hates America. If they wanna go after Americans, if they wanna assassinate Americans, they wanna kill Americans, they don't ask you whether you're Republican or Democrats. They, they, they care about 
at the Islamic Republic. And for me and millions of Iranian activists, we don't care whether Trump is in power, Obama is in power, or Biden is in power. We care that no, who should not be in power, which is the Islamic Republic. Because here in America, at least, we have freedom of expression. We can take to the streets and protest against Trump or Biden without getting killed, without getting raped in prison. Is that too much to ask? That when it comes to Islamic Republic, see this as bipartisan issue and support the voice of Iranian who say, we don't want the Islamic Republic. Well, see, you make such important points. It's very important, I think, as we make policy decisions to consider you know, the, the record of, of, the, of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the theocratic dictatorship across more than 40 years and the ideology of, of the revolution that drives and constrains it and, and has resulted in, in really permanent hostility you know, toward the United States. So, you know, I, I, when we relieved sanctions earlier, when the Obama administration did uh, under the, the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal, of course, that money went to strengthen the criminalized patronage networks that keeps the regime. To revolutionary guards. And it to went to the IRGC. Guards. IRGC, absolutely. Uh, the regime doubled its stipend to Hezbollah, uh, expanded the, its proxy army in Syria, uh, grew the militias in, in, in Iran, uh, support, increased its support for the Houthis in, in Yemen. Uh, so I, I think it's immensely important uh, that people listen to you and, and understand the nature of this regime. And I, I'd like to ask you, how stable you think the regime is? Of course, as you mentioned, these protests began with the horrible murder of Masa Amini at the, at the hands of the morality uh, po police. But, but of course, it, it's grown. I mean, we just saw that uh, that you know that that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's birthplace and museum was burned. I think I think unprecedented anger uh, toward the theocratic dictatorship. You know, there, we have seen some strikes, but not strikes on the scale of 1979. That was a it was a big factor in the, in the revolution then. Um, do, do you see any other developments in the future, like dissension in the in the in the security apparatus, or you know, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei? We should point out to our viewers is quite old and ill. Uh, would his death uh, result in, in 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 further weakness in the regime? But I, I just like to to hear your thoughts on the future, where this movement goes, and and uh, and and how you see. Uh, how you see the regime evolving, especially in terms of its ability to to maintain, you know, its brutal grip uh, on power. Look, I have to say that the future is bright. The revolution happened inside our heart. Many people believe that this is just the beginning of the end, the end of the Islamic Republic. We see a unique sense of unity among uh, Iranians inside and outside. This is, this is very unique that for the first time in our history, well-known athletes saying that we're no longer proud of ourselves being part of national team. You know, I know that this is the moment that many Western media are talking about World Cup, but many people inside Iran, they don't even see that Iran's football um, team represent the people of Iran. They believe that this football team represents the dictators. And, um, and many athletes right now that I'm talking to you, they quit their job. Many actresses, well-known actresses, uh, posing in front of camera, removing their hijab, which is a punishable uh, you know, crime, punishable act of uh, protest. And they're saying that no longer we want to be part of propaganda tool to normalize the Islamic Republic. And this is very unique. This is for the first time in the history that we see sense of unity among oppositions inside and outside Iran, saying that, uh, we, you know, this is a marathon. We're, I'm not saying that this is going to happen overnight. We have a really tough road ahead, but even the army, the regime doesn't trust the army to call on them and ask them to go and uh, oppress people, suppress the protests. And that's why they're using revolutionary guards. They're using Basiji and plain clothes. And another thing that makes it different and makes the future bright, that the relative of uh, Khamenei, Khamenei's niece and nephews, they come up in front of camera saying that, calling the Western countries to isolate Khamenei. They're calling the democratic leaders, the leaders of G7, um, to sanction Khamenei and hear the voice of Iranian 
to uh, close their uh, Iranian, their embassies in Iran and kick out the Islamic Republic officials. You know what? Sooner or later, Iranian people are getting uh, united and being, getting, they, they're going to be successful to get rid of the Islamic Republic. But with the help of the Western countries, uh, with the support of the Western countries, believe me, less teenagers, less children get killed. Right now that we are talking, more than 400 people got killed, including 62 children. So these are the, the people who, led, who are leading this movement, the revolution inside the country. And now they're calling the, the West that this is the time that you have to take action. Well, see, even, even the regime, I think, just, just uh, admitted to killing over 300 people. But I'm sure the numbers are much, much higher than that. And maybe even the ones that, that you mentioned. You know, you know the, the mechanisms of control you've already mentioned, the IRGC, the Basij, uh, also the, these criminalized patronage networks that have made people dependent on the regime and these bunyads and, and, exactly. and but 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 also it's information control. So could you talk about oh, your yeah. your efforts to sort of poke holes in in that information firewall to reach the Iranian people? How does the regime control information, and what more could the, the free world do to maybe reach the Iranian people with alternative sources of information? That's a very very good question, and this is very important that the world must pay attention to it, that the Islamic Republic is like Putin's government. They're really, really good at controlling information and um, changing the narrative of uh, the media, even reliable media in the West. I would, I would say, I would say, I would say, like, I would say China, too. If you've noticed, they're, bl they're, they're blanking out the faces of the crowds in the World Cup. So, so the Chinese people think that the, the, that the attendees or the fans are masked, for example. Yeah, and that, that, look, that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart, what you just mentioned, that Chinese government, Russian government, um, Venezuelan government, Khamenei, they are more united than democratic countries. They helping each other. They actually um, supporting each other and teaching each other how to oppress people inside the country, how to suppress uprising, and how to win their narrative in the West. They, all of them, China, Putin, Khamenei, Maduro, they all have their own lobbyists and apologists, believe me, in the Western reliable media. Yes. Right now, there are two massive uprisings taking place in China, in Iran. But the Western media's focus is about World Cup. These teams are not national team. These are actually the tools that normalize the dictatorship. Imagine, imagine, I mean, honestly, I have a simple question. Imagine it was not in Iran. It was the women of America being kicked out from the um, stadium just because of being women. Imagine it was just women in France, in Sweden, Germany, not women of Iran, being kicked out from a stadium just because of being women. What would have been the reaction of FIFA? Right. What would have been the reaction of the rest of the world? Then what is different between women of Iran and women of the West? So you see, girls are being kicked out from school right now and getting killed if it was girls in America. The world would go outraged and crazy, no? But right now, now there are some media in the West giving platform to the apologists of the Islamic Republic. No, I, you know, you know, I'll tell you, I listened, I listened to a podcast this morning because I wanted to, you know, prep for our conversation a little bit here, the latest on the protests. And and the person being interviewed was a complete regime apologist, clearly planted in, in a Western think tank. Uh, or, or university to apologize for the regime. And and so how, what, what more can we do to, to win this information competition? I mean, we should be able to, don't you think? I mean, we have free and open society. We are there. We are there. Let me be very clear here. President Obama just admitted recently, he said that it was a mistake not supporting the green movement. Then now we have to find out who gave him advice the same people that are running around trying to revive the nuclear deal. And you know exactly, exactly. what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so, so you see, it's not difficult. Yeah, it's right. not difficult. Right. President Obama admitted, uh, Hillary Clinton admitted, we, we welcome this. This is all we needed. But listen, 
more than 100 people got killed during 2009 demonstrations. Yeah. Now this is the duty of researchers, human rights organizations to go after those who gave advice to Hillary Clinton, to President Obama. I can name them. Part of them were uh, like people from NIAC. They went to CNN and um, they gave interview. You can go and listen to them. They were saying that don't support green movement because you will put uh, people in Iran in danger. Now they should be all kicked out. Uh, these people are now trying to give advice to President Biden. Yeah. Thank uh, to uh, Biden's administration. So they changing their tone now. They're not listening to them anymore. But they have to actually make it clear that this is not a fair battle. Iranian regime cut off the internet, filtered social media for Iranian people. Then why? Why the tech companies allowing? the dictators like Khamenei to enjoy freedom. You remember when the tech companies kicked out President Trump, left and liberal were like supporting this idea, no? Right. Those are the same people. When I called on uh, the tech companies to kick out Khamenei like two, uh, three years ago, what happened? Those people were saying that, no, in the name of the freedom of expression, we have to allow the Ayatollahs to be on social yeah. media because we want to know what's going on in their mind. Really? You don't and, know and, what's and going to, on and to, buy, and to buy advertising you know, to, for their propaganda as well. I mean, it's it is it is really it is really crazy. I, it is so, sad. So, it so, is so, so, sad. so what what uh, how, how how do you think we're doing? Uh, we you know just being the, the West generally, uh, those outside of Iran are doing in reaching the Iranian population. Of course, the Iranian population. I mean, our, our viewers probably know from the intro is extremely diverse, right? You have. Persians, Azeris, Kurds, Lur, Baluk, you know, Arabs, Turkmen, various Turkic tribes, right? Eight lang different languages are spoken. It's very, extremely diverse country. Could, what's your assessment of the degree to which these groups uh, have access uh, to outside information? Look, I have to say that this is the time. And when we see that the people inside Iran, from Kurds to Turks to Baluch to uh, Arab, I mean, Every single person that you talk, they say that this unity is beautiful. Men and women, which the Iranian regime tried to uh, like use men against women in the name of honor. But now we are all united. This is the time that the democratic countries must be united and take specific action. First, first and most important than anything. When Iranian regime cut off the internet, I want the Western democratic leaders to help us, the human rights organizations, media, help us to get the attention of the tech companies to kick out the dictators from, from the same social media that Iranian are banned to use it. Second, the, President Biden not only stopped the negotiation uh, with the murderers and sending billions of dollars to revolutionary guards, they have to call their allies, the European allies, uh, and, uh, and convince them to downgrade their diplomatic relation with the Iranian killers and, and ask them to free all the innocent political prisoners. Listen, now that I'm talking to you, the UK citizen, uh, US citizen, Bri uh, the, the German citizen, French citizen, Swedish citizen, they all are in Iranian prison and they're being used like bargaining chip to get a nuclear deal. This is the time the leaders of these countries must get united and close their embassies in Iran. It's not too much to ask. It's not me saying that. There's a petition going around. More than a million people signed this petition. Iranians, they're asking the democratic countries to kick out the Iranian officials and diplomats from the Western countries and their relatives, do an investigation. The Iranian, you actually clearly, you talked about the nature of the Islamic Republic, the nature of the Revolutionary Guards. Yes, taking hostage, killing, torturing, um, and, and raping innocent girls in prison, it's in the DNA of the Islamic Republic. It's in the nature of the Islamic Republic. And now we want the rest of the world to see that it's not just gonna stay in Iran, in region, in the Middle East. Now Khamenei is helping Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. So you see, it's not just about us or just about people in the Middle East. If you want to make the world much safer place, if you're really looking for a stability in the region, then you have to support Iranian people to get rid of uh, the Islamic Republic because the Islamic Republic is a 
threat not to just its own people, to democracy. Well, see, you, you mentioned the, you know, the, the long proxy wars that the, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps has waged uh, in the region, really worldwide. I mean, in, including you know, terrorist attacks in, in Europe and in, in, in South America, uh, the hostage taking. You know, of course, as, as Americans, remember we remember the hostage crisis after the revolution, 52 Americans held for 444 days, the bombings in Lebanon in 83, the Cobar Tower bombings in 96, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, really what Iran did to, to kill American servicemen and women, over 600 uh, in, in Iraq, uh, in, in using proxy forces uh, during the, during the, the Iraq war. Um, and then, and then of course, you know, recent actions with attacking oil tankers, you know, the, the support for the Houthis who are attacking the Emir, Emiratis and the Saudis. What do you think the likelihood is that the regime to damp down the protest movement will, will stoke some kind of a crisis or conduct an attack outside of Iran to divert attention from the protest movement and to stoke Iranian nationalism? And if they do that, what, what, what will the result be? Will people forget the, the protest movement and direct their vitriol and ire against you know, the, the great Satan again and, and uh, their Arab neighbors. I, I don't think it's going to work, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the likelihood of, of, an, of, of a, maybe a dangerous, provocative external attack. And what would be the response, do you think, in, in Iran if the regime tries to use that attack uh, to end the protest movement? I mean, they're already doing this, you know, now uh, the regime sending uh, missiles and attacking uh, the Kurdish base in, in, in Iraq, in Kurdistan. Why are they doing that? Possible attack might happen to Saudi Arabia. To I mean, anything that you can guess the Islamic Republic did to actually take the attention of, uh, the, to, 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 to suppress this protest. What I, what I can say that here, now we are, we are we were speaking about uh, Iranian people in the streets, which we never talked about this. The Iranian regime is killing children, 62 children. I mean, if the Western countries don't, you know, I can understand the hypocrisy of some of the Western countries about feminism, which they say that we care about women's rights, but when women getting killed, then say, okay, you know, we're not gonna talk about this. But how about children? How about children? Must see, I'll tell you, a, fr a, fr a friend of a friend of mine who came who came from a village like yours and is still very well connected with the people there told a story about a women's high school, girls high girls high school. Uh, they 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 brought the girls outside and and were trying to force them to sing patriotic songs to film it. Instead, they sang anti-regime songs. Anti, and what happened? They, they were beaten, and and one of the girls was was beaten to death. Yes, and this is the daily news in Iran. This is the daily news in Iran that children not only getting killed they getting raped you know before when i was talking about this people were saying that you're exaggerating now thanks to cnn they did an investigation and they found out that how teenagers are getting arrested and they're getting raped in prison and right now that i'm talking to you that people are scared to send their children to school because teenagers need the school principals anymore so that's why their lives are in danger. One of the girls was actually sending videos to me. I, I was worried about her safety. And she was saying that my mom every day telling me that when you go out, I'm worried that you get you might get killed like Nika Shakarami, 16 year old, like Sarina Ismailzadeh, 16 year old. And then she was saying that, I just told my mom that I'm already a dead person when I don't have the right to choose what I want to wear, I don't have the right to dance, I don't have the right to sing, when I don't have the right to ride a bicycle, when I don't have the right to walk freely, when I see in front of my eyes that my classmates getting killed, getting tortured to death, 16 year old, 14 year old, there are many school boys they wrote on their Instagram page. I cannot even believe that. They wrote on their Instagram page that this might be our last post. But if this is my last post, I want to say woman, life, freedom. But I want to go to streets because I am fed up with the Islamic Republic. I don't know in what language I can talk to the Western countries to understand that these children are not just fighting for themselves. They are actually trying to fight 
for democracy. They're trying actually to save the rest of the world from one of the most dangerous regime. Yes, the Iranian regime actually released the American diplomats when they took them hostage, but they have been taking 18 million Iranians hostage for 40 years. We get lashes if we say that we don't want to cover ourselves. You never saw that on media until the day that Mahsa Amini and these teenagers got killed. When we were saying that the, you know, hijab is not our culture, we get lashes, we get arrested, we go to prison, people were like, shh, now this is the time. I strongly believe that if we don't see any international women's march around the world to support Iranian women, if we don't see that the Western countries recognize their revolution and stop their diplomatic relation with these murderers regime, then there is no reason for Islamic Republic to stop killing people. They keep continue oppressing people, suppressing the protests and killing the teenagers and children because there is no reason for them. The only thing can survive the Islamic Republic right now, it's the West. Otherwise, Iranian people themselves, they will bring the regime down. And I am sure that we will be successful. The history will judge those who could support Iranian people, but they decided to support Iranian regime. Masi, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us. I can't think of a better way to, to wrap up our discussion than with your call to action. I, I know that you have taken on some great personal risk yourself. You've been under threat from the regime. I, I, I appreciate your, your courage. I'd like to just give you an opportunity for any, any closing thoughts you have for, for our viewers and our, and our listeners. I just want to tell you that how thankful I am to be in America to have the right to express myself. I'm not scared of my life. I mean, even the day when Salman Rushdie was the uh, target of assassination plot, I was like, I'm ready to go on the same stage where he got stabbed and talk even louder against the danger of the Islamic Republic and its leaders fatwa against Salman Rushdie to get the attention of the rest of the world that this is the time if we don't get united to end Islamic terror, believe me, the Islamic terrorists will get united with the help of Putin, China, and all the dictators around, and they will end democracy. So just support us. I'm not even asking the Western country to bring regime change. We're doing it ourselves. All I'm asking that help and support the people of Iran who are bravely taking to the street, facing guns and bullets, and trying to support, to, to, to save democracy, to save the rest of the world. That's all. Thank you so much for having me in your show. Masih Alina Jad, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, thank you so much for helping us learn more about a very important battleground uh, and, and how, how we might work together uh, to build a future of peace and prosperity for generations to come in Iran and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next time, I hope I'm going to invite you to Iran, to my beautiful country, which you're going to love it. Hey, it's my favorite food in the world, for sure. <laughs> and I would love I would love to take you up on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.